Okay, we are good to go. Um, okay. Oh. Superintendent Reichman? Um, yes, I just wanted to make sure we all could see the interpreter. We can now, so go for it. Uh, thank you. It, it is four o'clock now is the time set for the board meeting of the Arizona State Schools for the Deaf and the Blind. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining us in this alternative format. Uh, thank you for your resiliency uh, during this difficult period, uh, which we'll hear uh, more about later in the meeting. Um, so the first order of business is to do the roll call. And for that, I will uh, cede the floor to uh, Suke Kneifel for that. This is Suke. Um, Linda Bove. Here. Lynn Linda Davison. Bove. Here. Mike Gordon. I'm here. Shelly Herbold. Hello, I'm here. Dean Howard. Here. Suke Kneifel present. Mike Manley. Here. David Nigro. I am present. And Mark Sims. This is Dean, he'll be joining us in just a sec. He just texted me. Okay. Uh, thank you, Suke. Uh, the next item on our agenda, item 1.02, information item, executive team reports. Um, and the uh, executive team reports are uh, located in the uh, board docs uh, area. Um, so we were all able to see uh, those reports. Um, are there any questions? And again, I'll, I'll pause and, and pause my video and, and mute to give you uh, an opportunity to comment. But um, if uh, anyone, any of the board members would like to comment on either the human resources, information technology or operations report, uh, please do so now. And again, I'm, I'm going to pause my video and mute um, to allow people time to comment. This is Mark Sims, I'm on. Sally Herbold. This is Shelly. I do have a question in regards to the stay at home order with staff and students. How are they progressing with the Zoom meetings um, online? Also, I'd like to know if there are any concerns or barriers in regards to accessibility with technology. I know in some areas they may not have access. And in the report, it said that they had not been able to contact, I believe those 53 families. Um, has anybody gone out to check on those students? And my third question, is there any, um, mental health counseling being available and, and provided to those students. So those are my questions in regards to that report. This is Annette speaking. Um, our assistant superintendent, Kristen Rex, will have answers to those questions in her report. So if you can just hang on for a few more minutes, we'll turn it over to Kristen and she would be happy to respond to those questions. So are there any questions related to the negative team reports? If not, I can back to you, um, Chairman. Nigro, President Nigro. Um, thank you, Annette. Um, Shelly, those are all great questions. And I am 
eagerly awaiting the answers in our next um, our next uh, agenda item. Uh, but again, just one final call for any of these reports. I'm going to stop my video and mute it just for one more moment. If there are any questions on these particular reports, um, please uh, raise your hand or otherwise let us know and, and you'll have the floor. Uh, okay, so I, I don't see any. Um, so we're going to move on to item 1.03, information item, assistant superintendent report um, for assistant superintendent, Dr. Rex. Uh, Dr. Rex, I know you have prepared remarks. I know there's already been a question asked uh, or several questions asked um, from uh, uh, board member Herbold, which I think are all on our minds among others. So um, if you will, uh, if you can give us your report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is Dr. Rex. And yes, I do have an updated list of information that I'd like to share with you at the end of that sharing. If there's additional questions, I will be happy to answer them. Good afternoon, President Nigro and ASDB board members. On March 17th, ASDB's world changed as we know it. We were thrust into a situation that did not just affect our students, staff, and stakeholders, but rather it affected our state, our nation, and our world. Our 16th president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, once said, I'm a firm believer in the people. If given the truth, they can be depended on to meet any crisis. The great point is to bring them the real facts. Over the past weeks, the ASDB administration has been providing facts and directives in real time adjusting to new information as it came in, with sometimes changes occurring daily. We know we can always improve on communication, but ASDB leadership has taken the challenge to inform our staff, to help better serve our students, and it is proving to be successful. For many of our leaders here at ASDB, when the COVID-19 pandemic arrived, they were determined to give information to support staff, so we met daily. Facts were disseminated as soon as possible. Our teachers and staff that provide educational opportunities have been challenged to provide instruction to our students in a remote format. In spite of the new delivery reality, they have risen to the challenge and we supported them with means to deliver service and opportunities to work with each other to share ideas and strategies. There has been no easy route through the past eight weeks. Besides the obvious problem of selecting the correct path to take, 
Our instructional leadership faced monumental tasks of consistency, reassuring staff, persuading them to follow through on decisions, and operating on limited information in a very short period of time. One wrong move and we could have eroded the trust that has been built. But the ASDB staff has been strong, flexible, innovative, and truly seeking any and all ways to support our students as they are home for the remainder of the school year. We have found unique ways to connect with each other, our students, and we keep pushing out the message that we are here to help, educate, and we are continuing school. In a time when our teachers are usually wrapping up their instructional learning activities in their classrooms, beginning their end of the year activities, wondering what students will be in their classes next year, where they'll be teaching classroom wise, their current reality is dramatically different than last year. And now they are focused on, will everyone's internet work today during my lesson? How are we collecting all the equipment that our students use for access for their learning at the end of the year? Will remote learning be how we begin next year? All the typical year end activities challenges and stressors, they've changed. You had my report that was submitted for your review, but in the time that I gave it to Leticia to prepare for this meeting, new information is now available. And as we have done for our staff throughout the past few weeks, I would like to update you with the most current information. This information is on instructional opportunities we are serving, information that we are getting and receiving, and actual data from the Birth to Five ELP program, our schools, and our cooperatives. The ELP program has experienced many successes as well as challenges along the way. And to demonstrate some examples of this, our parent toddler classes that were once held on site are now being held online for families. One parent had this to say about this opportunity. Quote, I found the group very informative. It was helpful to get input on ways to use our skills were learning and a sounding board to help stimulate my son. I knew the basic concepts, but I didn't know exactly how to implement this as part of his therapy, and I appreciate the help. One of our preschool teachers had this to say about the last two months for instructional delivery. Quote, this is an uphill battle, but I would do it again for my students knowing that maybe those 10 minutes I saw one of my kids is making a tiny, tiny difference. I can't wait until I can hug them for real again. The day I'm allowed to do that, I will be on their doorstep. This is an important note for our board. The number of families that we serve on the Navajo Nation has been affected. A few of our teachers in Northern Arizona have lost almost their entire caseloads, but we will continue to reach out and be available for them as they are available to receive our services. At this time, we are respecting their request to allow them to heal and stay healthy. Some quick facts about ELP since the school closures. In birth to three, deaf or hard of hearing statewide, blind and visually impaired in Northern and Southern Arizona, 
the ELP has contacted 90%, 96, excuse me, 96% of their families. They're providing services to 37% of the families at least one time a week. They are providing services to 43% of the families at least every other week. 85% of our families are receiving services are doing so through video conferencing like Zoom. The rest of them are using the phone, emails, and text messages. We are periodically checking in with 17% of families at their request. 3% of the families prefer no contact at this time. 17% of our families have children turning three during our school closures. 79% of these families have opted to continue with the birth to three service plan until our regular schools are open for them. At the preschools on the Tucson campus and Phoenix Day School for the Deaf, for preschool, we are providing service to 82% of the families at least one time a week. We are providing services to 4% of the families at least every other week. 86% of our families receiving services are doing so through video conferencing, while the rest are using phones, emails, and text messages. In the preschool, we are periodically checking in on 6% of our families and 8% of our families in the preschool want no contact at this point in time. An update on the Tucson campus. All 125 students on the Tucson campus have been contacted and are being provided educational opportunities. The engagement level of these opportunities varies between grade levels and families. Some of our students are fully engaged. Others, um, getting contact and actual time to work with kids has been a bit hit and miss. But our teachers and our related service providers and counselors are checking in at a minimum of once a week. The educational opportunities are being delivered through Zoom, Google Meet, Google Classroom, email, phone, and through paper instructional packets. These are being mailed home. The school currently mails 25 packets out to students each week, and these 25 packets cover 20% of the student population that has chosen this option. The PDSD campus has been led by Nancy Alexander, Amber Apkinitis, Flint Fears, and Jill Voigt. As Courtney Fritz is, was on maternity leave. And as you know, Courtney is very organized and she had planned out the time very well. And all the roles and responsibilities were very clear. And then the pandemic came. <laughs> And the plans changed. But at this time, I'd like to give a shout out to the team. They adjusted. They stepped up during this difficult time. And our assistant principals, with the support of Nancy Alexander, made things happen. Great ideas, planning, execution of what needed to be done for our staff and our students. It was truly impressive. In our K-2 grades, we have 37 out of 40 students that have been reached and are actively learning. In our third through fifth grade, 
We have 44 out of 46 students that have been reached and are active. Students participating in educational opportunities um, in a variety of ways. Some are doing packets. Some are doing story time through Zoom. Some have some one-on-one -on -one interaction through Zoom. Other resources such as Khan Academy, MobyMax, and all sorts of other instructional things that we have when school is regularly in session have been made accessible to our students. In our sixth to eighth grade, 50 out of 58 students have been reached and are actively learning. These students are participating through Zoom, Google Classroom, and some are using email. Our teachers continue to have their Google Classroom sites updated and work is posted and submitted electronically. Zoom sessions are used to teach and clarify content and our middle school teachers have been checking in with their homeroom students daily. In our high school, 101 out of 101 students have currently been reached and are active. Students are participating in educational opportunities through the same resources. And at this time, we anticipate that 40% of the high school students will be improving their letter grade from the third quarter, which shows that things are happening. 25% of our high school students have earned at least half a credit or more through our ed option courses during the closure alone. Students in the high school are continuing to work online in various subjects. We have Zoom meetings that are occurring with ed option staff, students, and we still have our online facilitator from PDSD to help with those courses. All of our teachers have attempted to reach out multiple times to students that we have been unsuccessful. And unfortunately for those few, we continue to have no luck and they have dropped off completely, but we have not given up and we continue to reach out. Both, uh, excuse me, both schools have continued to develop activities that will continue student engagement school spirit and pride, and ways to continue to grow and learn. Some examples, uh, we have teachers dressing up to keep students engaged and excited. Uh, I've seen some costumes. I've seen unicorns and uh, minions and M&Ms. Um, one of our teacher has driven to a student's house several times in order to provide sticker charts because of some behavior management and social distancing is definitely practiced but the student is very excited when they see their teacher. Some students get so excited for their teachers to be welcomed into their home through Zoom and they get to see their rooms or their toys or their pets as they continue to connect during these lessons. We have a teacher that is currently learning Arabic so she can communicate better with the family that she is serving a couple of our students. Um, we even have a group of high school students that have reached out to a teacher and have requ requested to do a play. And they have selected a play and they meet by Zoom two times a week and they go through the play. We have students that have finished their coursework and have asked to take on more classes and want to try to earn another half credit. So our schools, even though we're not in one place, we are reaching out to many places. And now to our cooperatives. Um, our cooperatives have been busy gathering data, developing systems to collect information consistently and ensuring our statewide itinerant services are developing their quality assurances and our information will be easy to retrieve. All cooperatives have reached out to their districts and I have the following data to share with regard to our cooperative students. We are currently serving 274 district and charter schools with instruction. 
Our cooperatives serve 1,298 students statewide. Of those 1,298 students, we have reached out and made contact with 1,146. Of the students we are serving right now, 77% are continuing to receive direct instruction. 15% are receiving consultative, consultative instruction service. And we are still seeking to connect and support those 77 students statewide that we are missing. We do have 6% of our total families that are refusing service at this time as of today's date. And to let you know, our directors in each cooperative are working with their districts and the families to address concerns and needs as they come up. There are weekly update meetings held to gather information, make follow-up calls, reach back out to families, special education directors, and to develop plans to support our students that we are serving. My final update is a board action item that you will have the opportunity as board members to vote on in a moment. I have submitted um, a recommendation for the contract for the Phoenix Day School for the Deaf principalship for 2020-2021 school year to Courtney Fritz. Courtney Fritz had resigned this position and did not sign a contract in hopes to be able to stay home with her daughters and support her husband's new um, career opportunity. To let the board know that I did post the PDSD principal position the PDSD staff developed ideas and concepts of what they needed for school leadership for a principal through a survey. From that, we developed questions along with research-based behavioral questions that are used to hire a principal. The plan was to have a screening committee submit names for interviews and a rubric was used. There was an interview panel that was selected with agency representation as well as PDSD staff. We conducted interviews. Unfortunately, no one candidate internally or externally had enough support to move this plan forward. The position of a K-12 principal is challenging due to the grade span and no one candidate was able to demonstrate through this interview process the necessary skills, experience, confidence and attributes during this selection process. Along with the COVID-19 challenges and changes to how we'll be doing school in the future, it became apparent to Annette Reichman and myself that we needed to develop another plan to support the students, the staff, and the parents of PTSD. We have many steps in preparing for the 2020-2021 school year in August, and I cannot think of a better team by offering Courtney Fritz this position and keeping the current assistant principals to help move this forward. I'm a firm believer in our ASDB staff and I've seen it firsthand. During this crisis with the information they've been given, great opportunities to learn for students has been delivered by our staff. I am in awe of some of the creative, innovative stories that I've heard over these last couple of months or weeks, excuse me, it seems like months. And I hope this information helps you as a board see the dedication and determination of ASDB. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Dr. Rex. That was uh, quite a, a bit of information. Um, I will pause now to have any other board members uh, give their or ask any questions of Dr. Rex. Um, so please, again, as we mentioned at the start of the call, um, please uh, raise your hand or otherwise indicate that you'd like to be called upon. I, I will look to see if I can acknowledge someone on the video. Okay, I see Linda. Um, I'm still swiping through. I see Linda Bo. Linda, um, I will give you the floor right now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rex. Thank you so much for that detailed uh, report. I really appreciate that. I was reviewing it online as well. It was a lot of information. But I did wanna take this opportunity uh, to make a comment and then also I have a question. So as being a part of the board, we do need to give uh, lots of praise to this team and all that they have done, the staff and the teachers and the students. Learning remotely, I mean, making this possible has been pretty amazing. I've heard some wonderful stories from the community um, and from your staff and it has really been challenging for them, but such a good experience as well as they've moved forward and implemented in such a quick time frame. And I am just very proud of the staff and the board is very proud. We need to congratulate everyone on um, this task that you have completed. Thank you very much. And also Annette, thank you for your vision and moving forward with that. Secondly, I do have a question related. Um, I am curious, actually, how will everything work out <laughs> as far as Courtney continuing to be principal this coming year at PDSD? And what is the vision and what that might uh, look like for this new year? Uh, I'm just curious what the vision is. And I'm curious to learn as well. Do you mind uh, sharing your plans? I can, oh, this is Kristen, excuse me. I can share a little bit of plans. Um, this plan came together last week, literally. Um, we have plans to bring Courtney back. We have plans to do some internal leadership learning experiences for our current assistant principals. And there are other people in the agency that want to learn and grow. We are really starting to understand the critical need to grow our own leadership. Um, Courtney will be a part of that planning. We will be meeting with the three assistant principals this summer and working through all that. We probably need to, and I don't want to steal Annette's thunder, we probably need to work on what the business of school will be in August. And she probably will give you more information on that. But I have every faith that with Courtney moving forward, um, they are not gonna skip a, skip a step. They are adjusting. These three assistant principals have had some on the job training that no one could be prepared for. And I think all four of them stepping back into their roles will bring about consistency and um, commitment and our students are going to be better better for our decision. So I think Courtney can probably elaborate upon that um, in the future. And if this board would like me to send my most updated information through Leticia to you so you can see all the statistics, I would be happy to do that because I was gathering it all today and putting it together and synthesizing it. So I will be happy to forward my information if that will help any of you with the actual data, because I know I gave you a lot. But um, honestly, I couldn't cut it because it was all so important. OK, um, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Linda. Uh, are there any other board members that have uh, questions or comments for Dr. Rex? 
uh, raise your hand or, or wave. I'm swiping through my, I'm on an iPad right now. So, okay, I see <laughs> Shelly. Um, and Shelly, you will have the floor right now. Okay, excellent. I'd like to ditto exactly what Linda Bove had just mentioned. Congratulations to all. I know it has been a challenge providing that education, the things that those students need, especially mental, emotional, and all of that combined. If you don't mind, I may have missed it, um, but if you could answer my question related to technology. I'm sure there are some areas out there um, that don't have access to technology. I do assume that that's part of the reason why you're sending out packets. Uh, so I just wanted to clarify that. Oh, you're Absolutely. saying yes, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then also, how do you maintain um, mailing those packets? Do they send the packets back? How is it handled? You have um, you have a couple of, of amazing administrators. I know that every Tuesday, Kelly Creasy was going in, downloading all of the information that the teacher sent for the students, packaging it, going to the post office, mailing it. And so it's kind of a back and forth and it's snail mail still works. Um, and we're going to do whatever it takes to get information and get information back for kids. Okay, okay. And then also, what about the counselors being available? Are they checking in with students and checking in on that um, mental and emotional, yeah. you know, abilities and the things that are going on in life, especially right now, those seniors yes. as well. Um, yeah. You know, they can't march together, they can't celebrate together uh, with their graduating class. I mean, not only seniors, of course, we want to check in on all of them. Um, but yeah, they've lost contact with friends. They've lost contact with teachers and and related staff. Has anyone followed up? Absolutely. Absolutely. All the counselors are connecting with our kids. Be looking forward to um, information on how we're going to be celebrating graduation. Definitely different than in the past. We are still honoring our kids. Um, the the social emotional is huge and that's why we've got to open our schools again this is this has done its job but this is not what kids need for the whole package it, it we've helped with academics we're helping with the social emotional but we need to be back in school without a doubt it's hard to replicate what a school is, but we are, we are making small strides, but we have room to grow and learn. Absolutely. Great question. All right. Great. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shelly. Um, uh, there's anyone else. I'll take another scroll through. Turn on your video and I don't see anyone else. I have just a couple of questions, Dr. Rex. Um, how I know, I understand, you know, when there are students that we can, can't contact, how do we contact the uncontactable? <laughs> Tenacity. We keep, we keep reaching out. We had a student that was in Mexico that we literally couldn't contact, but we started um, connecting through Facebook messaging and eventually we found the kid was still there and they found a way. Um, we, we do not stop looking for kids. We will continue to look for kids. Um, okay. Some people have literally fell off the grid. They have circled the wagons in their family and they, um, they, they are not open at this time to um, what we have, but we are not going away and we just keep reaching out. We are documenting every time and every way that um, we are trying to connect with our students. Okay. And I understand from your report that there are some families that have refused some of the, the teleeducation services. Can you explain why they would refuse? What's the, <laughs> why would they refuse them? Um, you know, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of reasons. You have families that have multiple children. And so um, 
they don't feel that they can they can do it remotely. You have families that are um, in crisis and you have families who are trying to find babysitters and working. And so school is um, a secondary to them at this point in time. And so that's why we try to keep circling back because we're hoping as as we move through this, that at some point they're going to be like, yeah, OK, things are starting to get somewhat more manageable. I do need help for my kid. And so we're, we're just documenting and we're going to have to just keep circling back. Um, I tell you what, there's some tenacious teachers out there that just aren't giving up. And I'm very proud to say that. Thank you. And, um, oh, uh, I, Lynn, I see Lynn is waving. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I will cede the floor to you and then I'll ask my two follow-up questions. Okay. And this is just a comment to um, kind of support what's going on. We're seeing the same thing in the public schools. There are students who are choosing not to receive services. There are students that we can't find. This is very reflective of what, what I've seen through the public school as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, in in terms of, uh, are, are we, do, is there a, a centralized effort to record our, our collective learning from this experience? I, I know that we've looked at as an agency, you know, teleeducation for a while, we've done some pilot programs. Um, we've wanted to develop that more. Um, we've kind of been forced to <laughs> quickly <Yes. laughs> deploy something. Um, do we have some kind of centralized effort to figure out what's working right now in the last couple of months um, and, and, and develop that further so that we can have uh, some sort of uh, sustained teleeducation service later. Where, where, and we can deploy that where it makes sense. It's not gonna be obviously right. what we in the last two months, but um, I, I want to make sure that we that we can at least learn something and, and have some value from this from this exercise. I, you know, I, I probably should have put that in my my spiel, my speech, because I agree 100 percent. We had people that avoided and said it absolutely cannot work when we were doing our pilot and our remote learning with um, um, director Michelle Lucci and her team. And now we have multiple groups zooming and reaching out and teachers are finding ways because as soon as they were denied their kids, they got super creative. Um, this is something that will not go away. It, it cannot go away because it is giving us the opportunity to serve everyone. It doesn't work all that great in some formats. I know that like uh, speech language pathologists and certain areas are, it's, it's not necessarily working, but for the most part, we are definitely finding ways to offer instructional learning opportunities. Okay. Great. I, I want to be sure that we're that we're writing this down. Yeah. Oh, we, I'm sorry. We do meet and um, we are evolving. I know at first we were just doing Zoom and then through IT, who shout out to IT, because I tell you, we wouldn't be able to do half the things that we're doing without um, the IT team, but they have been searching and they're always trying to stay one step ahead. A teacher will say, this doesn't work. How do I reach a parent this way? And they are practicing along the way. We're doing Google Hangouts now along with Zoom. We found that that was working better for some people's, um, the way they were receiving their instructions. So it's a quick learning curve, as you said, but it's not going away. We're definitely focusing on our future, and this is part of our future. Okay, uh, great. I see that Linda and Shelly both have their cameras on, um, and I'm going to go to Linda first and then to Shelly. So, Linda, you will have the floor. Thank, Thank you, David. Okay, at first we were apprehensive and then we were kind of forced. We had no choice <laughs> due to this emergency crisis. Um, and you took a step forward and you were innovative and you just did what you can. And typically there's a lot of energy with fear and anxiety and you just had to 
set that aside and do what's best for the students. Um, you have to do what's necessary. So for those students, um, it's very important for deaf and hard of hearing students to have access to their peers, especially because they don't have, many don't have communication access at home. Um, and when we're considering the children who are birth to five in the early learning program, are the parents taking the time to learn sign? Um, when the students, they go to school, they're there all day, they're in a language rich environment, and then they're coming home in the evenings and on the week on the weekends. Um, now they're fully in that environment with limited to no communication access. So I'm sure when they see their peers, they're very excited. Um, and that's powerful. That really shows that those students need that human connection. Um, and I know it all has to do with language and ASL. So I'm just curious about the future. And now that you've collected the data and we've had time to look at it, mm -hmm. um, and we're thinking about when is it the right time to do this distance learning and when is it not appropriate? So we'll have to do a lot of consideration and research and we have a great team, a wonderful superintendent I'm thrilled to hear more about that. Um, and hopefully th this remote learning will not be our new normal. Thank you for letting me speak. Absolutely. This is um, something that we were forced into, like you said, but um, in the birth to three, they managed to get grants and they passed out, I think a hundred tablets with data plans for, and they are going to our families on the Navajo Nation. And we also have our deaf mentors that are working with our birth to five. So although it's not ideal, um, it, is, it, is, it is not going away and, and we're gonna keep pushing forward and trying to find better ways to serve kids and families. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rex. Uh, Shelly, um, do you still have a comment or a question? Okay. Um, yes. All right. Uh, okay. Here is the floor. I do have a question. Shelly Herbold here. Um, sorry, I keep coming back to my three questions, three things. Uh, first of all, I'm still concerned about students' mental health, um, their emotional well being, being connected with a counselor. I'm wondering if you're collecting any data to track and show that students have met whether it be through Zoom, a phone call, a text, are you collecting that data? Yes, our principals um, are working with our counselors and they are documenting every connection, every not connection, when we don't get a hold of kids, we're still documenting that because we're still showing that we're reaching out. So if the school counselor is struggling, oh, <laughs> David, I'm sorry. I have two more questions, if you could just hold for a moment. Um, so if the school counselor is attempting to reach out to a student um, and they're unable to, they're documenting that, what are other methods that they're using to try to contact? Are they using different approaches to try to reach out to students and their families? Um, email. Um, it's like the same idea of trying to reach family. So how are they contacting, calling, email, yes. driving by their homes, whatever it, the door. <laughs> whatever it takes, what are the ways? <laughs> yes. With, you know, practicing social distancing and being safe, of course, we would never ask a staff member or put them in a position where they would have to be uncomfortable or something, but they are being very creative. And I can probably get, I can work with Courtney and Kelly to give you kind of an update on our school counseling and, and all the opportunities and groups and all that good stuff. Okay. On it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And my last question, David, <laughs> Mr. Nigro, I apologize. I have one more question. Um, 
for those parents or students who are declining services, um, and I'm speaking for middle school and high school students, if they're declining services, will that impact um, grades or potentially being able to move up to the next grade level? Um, will students have to repeat the same grade in the fall or will they continue to move up along in their academic plan? What's the plan for that? Again, I'm not going to steal Annette's thunder. That is a, um, it's an item <laughs> that we're covering. Um, the, the Arizona Department of Education had us develop. Oh, I can wait. Plan. Okay. Yeah, she, we'll cover that. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Shelly. And, and uh, I guess my, my final question, if we can, um, and uh, Dr. Rex, you mentioned the, the grant um, uh, to distribute the tablets with the data plans. I mean, you know, accessibility is, is always, you know, a challenge, I think, for us. And I know there are certain issues the agency, you know, can't solve, of course, but how are we making sure that, that, that students are able to have a, a device in their hand and have some sort of telecommunications or data plan um, to, to partake and, and make use of these of these education services. Um, the I'll have I'll have Kendra Benedict write up a little paragraph to help you with more information about the actual grant. We did not send out um, a lot of devices per se unless it was for accessibility. If we needed a Braille Note Touch or we needed something, we FedExed it way back when this first started. Um, we basically are taking the kids exactly where they are and with what they have. And we're, we're providing our educational opportunities that way. So the zero to five had that opportunity with the grants and Kendra, I'll have Kendra write something up for you guys in a paragraph, but everybody else, we just kind of took everybody where they were. We didn't pass out Chromebooks to everybody and have to recollect them. We just, it was all about accessibility first and foremost. Okay. Uh, right, and, and, and there are the the media accessibility. Sure, you know if they need a, a braille display or a right. CCD or or you know some other type of uh, right. Uh, then also, you know, we always want to be make sure that they have, you know, that they, they have some device to run Zoom uh, or to run Google Hangouts or something else like that. And if they don't, then we we'll, we do packets or we do phone calls or we you know we do we we've gotten creative. Okay. Uh, Great. Um, I'm going to scan one more time for <laughs> anyone. Again, I, with the, it's a lot easier when we're all together. Um, but I don't see anyone. So we are going to move on. Thank you, Dr. Rex. Um, we are going to move on uh, to the super item 1.04, the information discussion item superintendent's report. Uh, Superintendent Reichman, uh, you will have the floor. Good afternoon, President Nigro, um, members of the board, um, Assistant Superintendent Rex, and the ASDB community. I can't see you, but I'm happy you're here with us. Um, and I have asked the interpreters to go ahead and interpret because I want to make sure everyone can see what's being said. Uh, I'm a little too close to the camera to be able to see all of my signs. So I wanted to start with a reminder of what happened at the last board meeting. That seems like eons ago. But the last board meeting occurred on March 5th at the Phoenix Day School for the Deaf Campus. And during that board meeting, I shared with you just a real brief story. You remember that story about the importance of focusing on our goals. That story, just as a reminder, was about a sage in long ago India who wanted to teach the art of archery and the importance of focus. So he took a group of students into the forest where he had put on a branch a wooden, a wooden bird and asked the first student to, before he drew the arrow, to describe what was happening, what he saw. 
that first student said, well, I see the forest, the trees, the sky, the branches and the leaves. And the sage decided, hmm, hold on to that. He went to the second student and asked the second student the same question. The second student said, I see the eye of the bird. And so the sage had him draw his arrow and it hit the eye of the bird. So that shows the importance of focusing on our goals. If we don't, then it's easy to become distracted, to go off in multiple ways, to come across obstacles and then stop. That is, we don't move together, together. I also mentioned during the last board meeting a little bit about the COVID-19 pandemic. At that time, I stressed that we, our first priority was the health and the safety of our students and staff, and that we would do everything possible to keep them safe and healthy. Well, Fast forward 10 days. What happened 10 days later was Governor Ducey suddenly made the announcement that all schools were closing in the state of Arizona. And for us, our world was turned upside down. It was as if our forest became a desert suddenly. And the importance of focus became even more important because if we looked out at the desert, again, very easy to become distracted, wander off in multiple pathways and to get lost. So when we talk about that focus on goals, remember I said it was two things. It was the health and the well-being of our students. And two, it was providing the best education and supports possible to all of our students. That's still our goal today, despite what's happening all around us. So on March 16th, school was closed. We had to very quickly start figuring out what we were going to do next. And two weeks later on March 30th, we launched for the first time ever agency-wide online delivery of education and support to all of our students. That happened because our teachers, our professional staff, our IT department, our leadership team banded together and began planning very quickly. And together we were able to start the online delivery of education in just two weeks. If you had asked me in the March board meeting, if we could do that in two weeks, I would have said that was impossible. And yet we accomplished just that. So I'm not saying that was easy for us. It wasn't easy. It's still not easy. And it isn't perfect either, but we're doing it. It's happening. You heard from Assistant Superintendent Rex, all of the activities our teachers, our professional staff are doing to try to provide the best Again, the best education, the best specialized instruction, the best related 
services possible, the bachelor lay intervention to have families with zero to three possible agency-wide. We are doing that. When the dust kind of settled and we got used, used to our new normal, then we began to ask ourselves, what's next? What's going to happen this summer? What's going to happen in the fall? The short answer is nobody knows. Does that mean we sit and wait? No, that's not what we do. We already have started planning, thinking about getting ready for the summer and for the fall. But I wanna start with what we do know. We know that Governor Ducey has extended the stay at home order until May 15th. We also know that this week he announced a soft opening of our economy, meaning that I think tomorrow barber shops and hair salon can open up. And then next week, Monday, restaurants will be allowed to have people come in and dine in the restaurant with the understanding that they have to follow pretty strict social distancing requirements. We also know that Kathy Hoffman, the superintendent of public construction, has let everybody know that the Arizona Department of Education will be providing guidance to all schools in getting ready for the fall by the end of May. This afternoon, I just saw an email from Kathy Hoffman that she sent out to all school leaders confirming that yes, they've set up a task force and they're starting, they're getting ready to put together a draft guidance document to, for all of the schools. We are looking for that. So what is ASDB doing to get ready for the summer and fall? Well, first we are monitoring the Pima County and the Maricopa County Department of Health. We're monitoring the Arizona Department of Health Services, the governor's office and the Arizona Department of Education or any of their guidance and directives that we can incorporate into our re opening plan. The second thing we're doing is we've implemented, we've established a reopening committee, acronym ROC. That reopening committee, the purpose of that is to identify different scenarios different things that could happen this summer and fall and to develop plan that align with different scenarios. We just started working on that last week. Um, next week, our facilities director is bringing back some of the facility staff to again clean both campuses to look around and see how some, on a limited basis, some of our staff may be able to come back on campus, back to our offices, again, following very specific, strict social distancing guidelines, including use of masks and gloves and all of that.
But I want to take a moment to think about, for all of us to think about the long-term impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. We really don't know what the long-term impacts will be, but I have some thoughts about the potential impact that we're already seeing here at ASDB. The first impact is that the COVID-19 pandemic is not going away quickly, that we will be dealing with this for the next 12 to 18 to 24 months. So we have to be able to plan for that time period as to how we're going to respond to different situations as they come up. We know that the state of Arizona is already predicting a budget shortfall of $1.1 billion between now and next year, June 2021. I, when I look at that number, ASDB's revenues will have an impact on us. I am projecting some potential de decreases in our revenues. The Assistant Superintendent Rex just talked about the online delivery system. She said, we will never go back She's absolutely right. We will be moving forward with a hybrid model that combines the online delivery of education and supports and services, as well as in-person classroom format of education. It will never be fully one or the other. We will have a hybrid model. The other subject, I think President Nigro just briefly mentioned is, he didn't use this term, but it's what it meant, is disproportionality. Meaning some of our students have computers, they have laptops, they have tablets, they have different IT devices, and they have access to the internet. Some of our students do not. Either they don't have a laptop or they do, but they don't have access to the internet. We will have to be addressing this. And oh, by the way, some of our teachers don't have access to the internet as well. So when we looked at resources and how we provide services to our students in the long term, we're gonna to have to figure out how do we make sure that all of our students have the computer equipment that they need and they have access to the internet. And then the final thing is to look at academic achievement. Um, Assistant Superintendent Rex just said that some of our students were so motivated, they've actually improved on their grades. I mean, that's awesome. We weren't anticipating that. Um, at the same time, I do believe that for some of our students, not only will they have the challenge of catching up with the public school students, they will have to catch up on that lost time because of school closures. So those are just some of the thoughts I have that I wanted to share with you for your consideration. Before, we, before I end my board report, I do have a number of announcements to share with you. 
One is that I wanted to let you know, we just awarded a contract with Desert Voices, Desert Voices to establish a preschool three to five program in the fall. Second, we extended the contract with FBC, the Foundation for Blind Children, through next year in June 2021. You'll notice on our agenda, we, ha we, we have teacher contracts the reason we have teacher contracts is because ASTB, even during this time, continues to interview and hire teachers to get ready for the fall. So that's the reason that's on the agenda. You will have also on the agenda, and we can discuss more a little bit later, um, the grading and graduation requirements we're asking for your approval to allow us to use the third quarter grades transfer to the fourth quarter grades for all of our students. And for those students in the third quarter, they were getting ready to graduate. They were completing all of their credits. But in the fourth quarter, they go ahead and graduate. And then the final two is we're asking for your approval for a science curriculum that we want to implement in the fall, both on the Phoenix campus and the Tucson campus. And the last one is we're asking you to do a first read and approval of a telework policy. We've all been working at home without a policy. So we need to implement a policy as soon as possible, a telework policy. We have draft regulations that will support the telework policy once you approved it. And that concludes my report to the board. I'm happy to take any questions at this time. Thank you, Annette. Um, I will scroll through again, board members, if you can raise your hand um, and allow me time to locate you on Zoom. And I see Shelly is raising her hand. So Shelly, you will have the floor now. Great, thank you so much. Thank you for that clear explanation about third quarter grades being used as well for fourth quarter. I appreciate that. So when those students, if their grade is low and they need to increase that for fourth quarter, is that something that can occur? Um, and I do have some other questions as well. I don't know if we wanna go back to Annette to clarify that. That's a good question. I'm going to turn that over to Dr. Rex. Can you answer that? Shelly, was your question, if a student's grade was not so great in the third quarter, do they have the opportunity to improve it in the fourth quarter? <laughs> yes. Yes, exactly. That was my question. <laughs> Yes, and they have. Some students have completed courses and they are asking for more courses and some students are plugging along and we are, we are focusing on continuing to learn and grow, but we are just looking at educational opportunities and we would never hold it against a kid. We are working to help students improve their grades, yes. Okay, this is Shelly again. If you don't mind, Dr. Rex, uh, staying on. I do have another question. And that's related to the lack of parent uh, commitment. 
or possibly the struggle with access maybe to the internet and them having to use paper packets. I'm not sure if it is actually a standardized educational opportunity for all. So how do we uh, decrease that disparity in how those other students are learning? Uh, possibly some students do really well and will grow and maybe they're great with technology and they're able to pick things up a lot faster compared to other students that may struggle. Because it's just, and it's not really their fault per se, but how do we address those disparities um, within that learning? And maybe lack of internet it may be, or just absence of, of parents and due to the COVID virus. So when we come back in the fall and you know they've lost some knowledge there, I know some kids are definitely, you know, growing and improving as well, but what about those other students that are definitely going to be struggling when they come back? We are currently making plans for soon as students come back, we are going to be looking for any loss over the summer and during this time, and we will be finding ways in developing systems to continue to support kids on those specific skills that maybe they digressed on. Um, we are starting just that planning right now. We're trying to close up school, but the month of June is going to be quite busy because if we need to figure out any kind of compensatory services, that's something that's why we're gathering all this data. So we can know where our kids were during this time, what kids we could support during this time and what kids are going to need a lot when they come back and try to get some kind of baseline assessment as soon as they get to school so we can figure out if there was any loss. Absolutely, great question. And this is Shelly. So my last comment would be, I'm just wondering how those student, students might feel when they do come back. Noticing that those peers have kind of moved on and they haven't really grown during that time. So I'm wondering, that might be a bit tough for them to take. And some kids are really sensitive. I, I just really care about them. And so I wanted to put that comment out there. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we have that fantastic counseling and support piece, because that might be something that they can deal with in small groups or one-on-one. -on -one. And we have some fantastic um, counselors at both schools that will be and are chomping at the bit to work with their kids. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Shelley. Um, are there other questions or comments for Superintendent Reichman? Again, I'm scrolling through the video feeds. And I do not see any uh, for that. Um, um, and uh, Superintendent Reichman, I, I did have one question on the contract with Desert Voices. Um, in terms of the, the amount of instructional time that we're gonna have in that contract, um, I just wanted to, to ask about that. I think in the past, it may have been limited in some manner, but in this current contract, um, is that still the case or is that not the case? The Desert Voices contract, you had asked me that before, so I checked. Um, and it is all day, every day, five days a week, preschool. So there's no limitation in terms of the service delivery system. Um, there's no additional charges to the parents. It's free of charge to the parents. Okay, uh, great. So if the child has a diagnosis, they can choose any, you know, in terms of our options, we, we have uh, the PDSD campus, again, COVID notwithstanding, we have the PDSD campus program, uh, or parents can choose to, to, can choose to send their children to that. Uh, program which which has um, the uh, uh, you know the ASL only program. It also has the, the bimodal education, 
um, and the listening and spoken language education component, or if they choose, they can go to Desert Voices. Is that correct? Yes, and the IEP team. The decision is driven by the IEP. So it's the parents with the school districts um, with Desert Voices, with ASDB coming together and agreeing that the best placement for a particular child will be in Desert Voices. Okay, uh, right. And obviously we need input from the IP team, which includes the, the parents and, um, you know, the, uh, if it's appropriate for the child, we, you know, the, then we can go there. But if that's appropriate for that child, then they, they can go there and, and there's no, we don't have the issues that we had in the past. Yeah, it, again, it depends on the IEP um, in making a determination, the best kind of education, the best kind of language acquisition, the best kind of support for a particular child. Okay, uh, great. I'm, I'm glad that that is, is, is a, a more full option uh, now than it has been in the past. Okay, seeing no other Seeing no other hands, uh, we're going to move to item 2.01, consent agenda item. Uh, this is to um, consent agenda item, approve of the consent agenda, consistent with board policy to include items 5.01, 5.02, 6.01, 7.02, 7.03, and 7.04. Um, I will ask if there is anyone that would like to take up discussion of this and or would like to move or pull one of more of these items from the consent agenda. So I will scroll through. And again, just raise your hand so I see you on video if you'd like to pull one or more of these. And I see none. Uh, so at this point, if there is anyone that would like to move to approve the consent agenda, I would entertain such a motion. And if you'd like to make a motion, I, I think you can un start your video, unmute it, and then make the motion. This is Sue Kay. I am going to make a motion that we um, Approve the consent agenda, including items 5.01, 5.02, 6.01, 7.02, and 7.04. Uh, excellent. Do I have a second? I see Lynn raising her hand. I second the motion. Thank you, Lynn. Um, all in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda, uh, say aye. Uh, or you can raise your hand. How about we do this? You can unmute your uh, phone and start the video and give us a thumbs up. That'll be, uh, let's see, let's see your vote. So I see Sue Kay, I see Shelly, I'm seeing Dr. Sims, I'm seeing uh, Linda, I see Lynn, I see Mike Gordon, and I see Dean. And I see Mike Manley, they were all visually or physically representing uh, yes. I say yes as well. Uh, any nays, obviously that's, there's not. Um, so that motion passes, thank you. Uh, to the next agenda item, uh, again, briefly mentioned in Superintendent Reichman's report, Item 3.01, discussion and action item approval of grading and graduation requirements. Uh, this is both Superintendent Reichman and uh, Assistant Superintendent Rex. Uh, uh, Superintendent Reichman, I will give the floor to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is Superintendent Reichman. It's really simple. It says that the third quarter grades will become the fourth quarter grades and that those students who were getting ready to graduate in the third quarter that they met all of the credit requirements in the third quarter be allowed to graduate in the fourth quarter 
Um, this guidance came from the Arizona State Board of Education and rolled that out to school districts. So school districts are having all of their boards to prove it. So we are asking you as ASDB Board of Directors to approve doing this. Okay. Um, if any board members would like to discuss this matter, please uh, raise your hand, open your video and raise your hand. I will scroll through Zoom. And I see uh, Shelly raising her hand. Uh, Shelly, you will have the floor now. Okay, yes, this is Shelly. I do have a question. It does say, at the discretion of the teacher, the student may redo or re resubmit assignments. So do students have the option to keep that third grade, a third quarter grade and continue that in the fourth quarter and, and be done with it? Okay, I'm seeing a yes. Okay, great. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there any other questions from board members? Raise your hand. Uh, and seeing none, um, I will entertain a, a motion or do I have a motion to approve this agenda item? Uh, Lynn, I, I see Lynn. <laughs> yes, I move to approve agenda item point three zero one uh, to accept the ASDB grading and graduation guideline. Okay, uh, do I have a second? I see, Mike, Manley, I see Mike Manley has seconded. Um, so again, for the voting, if we can all turn on our video and show a thumbs up, uh, and I will say that I see uh, Lynn and Shelly and Sue Kay and Dean and Mike Gordon, uh, all with a thumbs up, as well as Linda, uh, Dr. Stims and Mike Manley. So uh, I vote yes as well for the record. So that, and. Uh, that's unanimous. So if there are if there are no nays, uh, then that motion carries. So thank you. And then we can move on to the next item, 3.02, the adoption of the science curriculum. Uh, Superintendent Rex, if you can take this item. Absolutely. This is asking for approval from our board for our science curriculum. We have already come to you with our English language arts curriculum, our math curriculum, and this is the third. Um, Orrin Katchoff and the team of science teachers went through the same process and vetting that we did as per board policy. And we are now bringing you what PDSD, ASD, and ASB would like to use. Um, in your attached documentation, we gave you the information of what we hope that you will be approving so we can get it ordered right away so we can be starting school in the August months with a curriculum adoption of science. Okay, um, are there any board members that would like to ask questions about this plan. Um, I see uh, Shelly raising her hand. Shelly, you will have the floor now. Okay, great. Yes, this is Shelly. So there are there any objections um, from the middle school or the high school? Um, I'm sorry, one moment. So as far as PDSD, okay, the elementary is not going to use it, but ASD and ASB, and then 
as far as the high school um, said no. What are the reasons behind that? I understand elementary is still working on ELA and math. I get that part. And then with ASD and ASB, um, I'm just curious about um, what those responses are regarding. As they went through the science curriculum adoption, what we found was our elementary teachers really want to have a deep, deep understanding. But I'm gonna turn it over to Oren at this point in time because Oren can probably clarify a little better than I can. Sorry, Oren, I didn't see you pop up till just now. You were, you were doing fine. Uh, <laughs> Good afternoon, ASD board, ASDB board, Superintendent Reichman, Assistant Superintendent Rex. So to answer that question, the ASDB or the ASD and ASB high school teachers did go through the adoption process. Uh, after viewing all the different curriculum which was proposed, they felt that if they continued to use what they have now, with just upgraded lab equipment uh, that they would be able to do the job that they feel they need to do. Uh, none of the, it wasn't that they objected against any of the curriculum. There were just none that they wanted to adopt. Uh, nothing uh, met, I guess, their rigor. So what they're asking for is for us to provide them additional funds to redo the lab in Tucson. Uh, and we have those funds, so we're moving forward and doing that. We're also going to be increasing the lab equipment at PDSD as well. Um, Oren, if you don't mind staying on for a moment, this is Shelly again. So the current science curriculum at ASD and ASB, does it meet the requirements? Um, of our state education system and the standards that are in place? It does. Those teachers have been using a mixture of what we have on Beyond textbooks, as well as what they have in their previous materials. Um, moving forward, we will be working with the principals to ensure that all instruction um, is directly aligned to the standards. And that would also be for the elementary um, so, you know, K through 12, making sure that all science is aligned to the academic standards here in Arizona. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, um, are there any other questions uh, for Dr. Rex? Uh, or I... I do not see any, I think I only had one Question, uh, uh, Dr. Rex, or, or maybe Aura, this, this, you could answer this. I, um, I know that ASB and ASD, the middle schools anyway, are going to be getting the same um, uh, curriculum. Uh, did the ASB staff take a look at the media accessibility for this curriculum? I know that when we looked at some of the other ones a couple of years ago, uh, we ended up going with a different selection for ASB because uh, they already had a lot of their materials that were on, I think on Bookshare, or some of the other ones didn't, um, and their their media was more accessible kind of out of the box um, for blind and visually impaired students. Um, did we look at that as well on, on the ASB side for the middle school? So um, that was one of the things that all, um, all the vendors, when they came out, there were questions about accessibility. Uh, our staff then for ASB uh, went forth and looked at it and that is what they recommended. Uh, I don't wanna say that without a doubt, um, this is the most accessible that we have, uh, but the teachers do feel that this is the best curriculum that they can use with our students to make sure that they master the science standards. Um, I can follow up uh, with those staff members who are representing ASB um, but I do uh, defer to their their experience. It, it is the same group who's been with us. One of the members has been the same member um, through both ELA, mathematics, and science, and I would defer to her 
or expertise in the area of what we should be looking for? Okay. Um, yeah, I, I would, I would think they're happy with it if they're asking us to approve it. Um, right. but just, we haven't spoken about this, uh, publicly before, or really at all before. So I wanted to make sure we have that. Okay. I can get the clarification for you on that. Okay. Uh, great. Um, if there are any other questions for the board, And there, I see none. So uh, if I could entertain a motion, or I will entertain a motion for this, or if anyone would like to make a motion to um, adopt this curriculum. Now will be the time you can open your video. And I see Sue K. This is Sue K. I move that we adopt the proposed cur science curriculum. Okay, and I will need a second. I see um, uh, Lynn holding up two fingers, which I think means second. Is that correct? Right. Yes, I second. Okay. Oh, perfect. Um, and all in favor of adopting this, uh, the science curriculum as proposed, uh, hold up a thumbs up. I see Dean, Shelley, Suke, Lynn, Mike Gordon, Dr. Sims, Linda, and Mike Manley, all with the thumbs up. I am voting uh, yes as well. Uh, all opposed, well, I wish there can't be because it's unanimous. Um, and uh, that motion passes. So uh, thank you very much. We move on to the next agenda item, 4.01 information item, uh, finance report from Shana Cooper. Is uh, Shana on the, oh, there you are. Hello, um, Shana is on the line. Shana, uh, you will have the floor, and I'm sorry I'm using first names more, maybe it's on Zoom and it feels more informal. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, Ms. Cooper, uh, you will have the, the, the floor um, right now. Thank you. Shana Cooper, Executive Director of Business Services. Good afternoon, Board President Nigro, Superintendent Reichman, Assistant Superintendent Rex, members of the board, and the ASDB community. Business Services has been working to close out the 2020 fiscal year, which includes continuing to pay staff members and vendor invoices, making sure that our goods and services will be delivered on or before June 30, 2020. We're also getting our power school, our student information system rolled over into the new school year and also working on building the budget for 2021. Before I begin to discuss the financial reports, I wanted to give each of you some updates as there has been a great deal of interest in the details of our financial projections and their impact on our planning. As Superintendent Reichman mentioned, the state's Joint Legislative Budget Committee's economic projections indicate that state revenues in the fourth quarter are projected to decline by 23.6%. For fiscal year 20, JLBC is projecting a $638 million shortfall and for fiscal year 2021, a $462 million shortfall for a total shortfall of up to $1.1 billion. JLBC will revisit estimates in early June. Based on meetings I have participated in and several conversations that I have had with other chief financial officers and key stakeholders of school districts, universities, and agencies across the state, there is still a lot of uncertainties. The state's Office of Strategic Planning and Budgeting over the last few weeks has indicated that the size of the recession is unknown and the hit to the state's budget will depend on one, how long before COVID-19 can be sufficiently contained, two, how long before the economy returns to normal, and three, what the possible long-term cost and side effects will be. OSPB has indicated that they have already started reviewing agency programs and will make suggestions for changes and or possible cuts 
in order to sustain the state's budget and address the projected $1.1 billion shortfall. Based on discussions that I have had with our OSPB analysts, she has indicated that on the surface, it's not expected that ASDB will get any cuts anywhere. However, she has reiterated that OSPB is in their data collecting phase and decisions are being made about the 2021 budget across the state. We expect to get more information within the next few weeks from OSPB and JLBC. With several weeks into the coronavirus pandemic, it definitely has been difficult for me to draw conclusions about the potential impact to our operations for the rest of this year, as well into the next school year. We're constantly thinking about how to spend less and continuing to try to implement cost-saving initiatives where we can. Some common sense practicing practices, excuse me, you are already doing includes not spending unless it's absolutely necessary and also looking at other available funding sources to use, which includes seeking out reimbursement for COVID-19 related expenses under emergency funding provisions. There are several budget scenarios and recommendations we are looking at given that a lot is still up in the air with our fiscal resources and the unknowns of what the impact will be to our revenues, as well as our payroll and non-payroll expenditures. Based on what is known and assuming no changes to our SCUNY budget that was provided in late March, budget commitments do include funding teacher pay raises under the third and final year of the governor's plan to provide a cumulative 20% increase in average teacher salaries by 2021. Additionally, there are no expected changes in funding for the assistive technology devices, which has historically been about 253,000, as well as for the preschool program at the Foundation for Blind Children of which we've been getting $1.05 million in our state appropriations. It should be noted that in our special line item, which you may have heard me say before is our school bus replacement, that line item was actually changed to school bus agency vehicle replacement to allow ASDB to purchase new school buses and general fleet vehicles. These monies have historically been a $738,000. The agency's 2021 budget ex is expected to be proposed to the superintendent and the finance committee the second week in June and provided to the individual agency departments the third week in June. At the July 23rd board meeting, I will provide more updates to the 2021 budget to the full board. I do wanna thank everyone for all that they do and continue to do for ASDB, especially during these very challenging times. But while we wait to get answers on what we don't know related to our finances, flexibility and support from the board, the agency's leadership team and all staff members will be needed. Nevertheless, we will continue to focus on ensuring that the budget adequately funds our operations and meets the needs of the agency to include developing effective mitigation strategies, as well as exploring new opportunities. If there are no questions or comments at this point, I will proceed and discuss the financial reports that have already been previously provided to you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cooper. If, if there are any board members that would like to ask any questions, um, please raise your hand. I am scrolling through. And I do not see any right now. Okay, seeing none. Uh, Ms. Cooper, again, thank you so much um, for your great work here. Um, it's, uh, I think every meeting, I, I appreciate it more and more. So um, thank you. Thank you. Um, for 
next item we have is item 7.01 discussion and action item initial presentation and urgent adoption of new policy gcka uh, maria murphy maria uh, ms murphy are you on the, the line here yes sir i am on the line however i am i am participating by phone because my phone froze earlier so my video okay. phone okay great um uh, ms murphy you have the floor Okay, thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, Board President Nigro, members of the board, Superintendent Rex, Assistant Super uh, Superintendent Reichman, Assistant Superintendent Rex, and everybody in attendance. You have before you, board members, uh, policy GCKA for professional and support staff telecommuting. This is a model policy that was just sent to us within the last month by the Arizona School Boards Association. We are recommending its adoption. Uh, the, uh, the staff did convene a subcommittee of subject matter experts and we have been working on things that are specific to ASDB for telework. And what we are proposing to do after the adoption of this policy is to make the things that are specific to ASDB a regulation which will give us a little bit more flexibility. Uh, administration is also recommending that this be adopted in one read due to the urgency of the situation. Uh, and because we are recommending that this be adopted in one read, uh, this would require two motions. Uh, the first motion is noted in your abstract to suspend uh, the two-read policy, which is delineated out in uh, board policy BGD. And then the second uh, motion would be to adopt GCKA uh, in one read. And with that, I can make myself available for any questions. Okay, um, thank you, Ms. Murphy. Is if is there are there any board members that um, have any comments about this policy? Please let me know um, by the showing of hands. And I don't see any right now. So as uh, Ms. Murphy had suggested, um, because uh, we're recommending. Uh, this be passed immediately instead of going through our normal first read and, and then adoption at the next meeting. Um, we would need to have two motions uh, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll make the first motion. Um, I move to suspend governing board policy BGB uh, related to first and second reading regarding policy adoption for the discussion and consider, consideration of agenda item uh, 7.01 um, of this board agenda dated uh, May 7th. 2020. Uh, do I have a second for that? This is Mike Manley. I second that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, seconds. And then again, if we can vote on this, uh, this motion, open your video um, and give a thumbs up. I see thumbs up from board member Davidson, Knightful, Howard, Gordon, Sims, Manley, uh, Herbold, and, and both. Uh, all opposed. Okay, it's not opposed to so that motion passes. And then um, I will need to have um, a motion to adopt policy, new policy GCKA as drafted. I see um, the board member Kneifel raising her hand. Um, this is board member Kneifel. Um, I motion to approve um, policy GCKA um, in one read. Okay, uh, thank you. Do I have a second? Uh, I see board member. I second. Okay, uh, we have a second. So now we can vote. And again, we'll vote the same manner. Everyone can hold a thumbs up. Um, I see board member Kneifel, Bove, Davison, Herbold, Howard, Gordon, uh, Sims, and Manley all voting yes with a thumbs up. I vote yes as well. Are there any opposed? which there couldn't be because it's unanimous, uh, then that passes as well. Uh, thank you everyone for that. Um, we can move on to the next item, uh, which is uh, 
8.01 discussion item agenda items for the next regular board meeting scheduled for July 23rd, 2020. Um, I, again, we're, uh, I would hope that we could have a physical board meeting in July uh, in, in a, you know, likely a social distance manner. Um, that remains unclear. I'm not uh, super enthusiastic about Zoom, but I think if we have to do it, we have to do it. Um, but in, in any event, if there are anyone, if, if anyone has a specific item that they'd like to bring up for that member, I, I see uh, board member Herbald raising her hand. Uh, so she will have the floor right now. Yes, this is Shelly Herbold. Sorry to um, sidetrack a little bit. Were we supposed to talk about Courtney Fritz, uh, the principal's contract? Do we need to take action on that? Is it an action item or? Uh, Board Member Herbold, uh, this is David. Um, so 5.0, item 5.01 was on the consent agenda, uh, which was passed uh, by way of uh, item 2.01. So, so we've, we've oh, been affected by passing My apologies, I overlooked that. Thank you for clarifying. Oh, no problem. Um, and I, oh, I'm sorry, Courtney Fritz was 5.02, We're also on the consent agenda item. The 5.01 were the other teacher contracts. Um, so we can return to 8.01 items for uh, discussion in the uh, for the next board meeting in July. I see Dr. Sims. Um, Dr. Sims, you you yeah, have. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I missed the last board meeting. Are we going to do this strategic planning? We um, our strategic planning is um, obviously been affected uh, by COVID, so we were, we were not able to get. Um, to move on that in the last few months as we would have liked. Um, Superintendent Reichman, if you can maybe, because well, you and I, Superintendent Reichman and I have talked about this. I would bit. suggest you've got a captive audience with Zoom. I mean, <laughs> I know it's not ideal, but it actually gets people together in a much better way than actually having people to have to move to a place. So Right, no, I, I, I agree. And I, and I, I think that we could do it. Um, again, Superintendent Reichman, I've discussed an approach for it. Uh, Superintendent Reichman, I can give you the floor and you can, you can discuss it now. Yes, um, we decided to suspend just for now the strategic planning because everything has changed and we needed to focus on making sure that we set up a system of online delivery of education and support. Um, and then right now we're starting the planning process for partially reopening our campuses and offices. We're looking to plan for the summer and then we're planning for the opening of school in August. We have to be prepared for whatever comes. That is the full opening with social distancing. That is opening and then closing and then being online again. That is a partial online, partial in-person classroom. So we have to be ready for different possible scenarios. So with that, it was, we, we have so many changes that to do a strategic plan at this point in time wasn't a priority, but I do want to get back to that. I agree with you. This is really a critical component of the agency and the board to develop a strategic plan. So I was thinking we could start in October, but if you have other suggestions, I'm open, I'm open. Um, I, I want to compliment and totally appreciate all of the work that the people in the agency are doing. That being said, the dialogues that the board could have are not precluded by all of these issues. So I think there are board level discussions that could proceed now and maybe by then some of the people would have a better context or a better understanding of where they want to go by October. That's my, my own 
gut feeling because I, I understand. I, I don't think I would say, how about we have Dr. Rex and you come in and give a whole presentation right now with everything you have going on. But I'm not sure that doesn't facilitate, doesn't preclude brainstorming and people having a more open dialogue about what they think could or should or shouldn't happen for the agency. So that, that that's my only take on it now. So if those were done, perhaps come October, you guys might be a little bit more settled for then it to be more of an interagency process where the leadership is directly involved in it. That's my only, that's my take. So. Okay. So I will confer with President Nagua and we'll see what we can do. And uh, this is David, um, uh, Dr. Sims, the, uh, we do have the other um, strategic plans uh, or planning uh, meetings that we have are still on the schedule and, and it's, it's still potentially, we could still proceed with those. Uh, we haven't canceled any yet. Um, we could still do, our agendas are likely gonna change because we're not as far along as we would have liked. Um, but to get the board together and talk, even if it's over Zoom at the next, you know, uh, scheduled area, we can still likely do that. But, you know, we're going to be limited in our input that we get from the leadership because their resources, as you mentioned, are frankly being, uh, you know, used on, on a COVID response. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly open to having that, uh, that next scheduled meeting um, and have it via Zoom. I, I know Zoom's a little bit difficult, um, you know, with, I think we've, we've done a a decent job today, um, you know, but it's it's a much different than everyone being in the same room. Agreed. Uh, in, in any in any event, um, yeah, for that next you know that 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 next strategic planning session that's still there. Uh, for the July twenty third board meeting, though, um, would you like to, to have an update on, on on any topics that we may talk about in June? Or I have no specific requests. No, okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, is there anyone else that has a suggestion for the 23rd? Um, I don't see any. I'm sorry, David, just to, um, is there not a mechanism for public comment during this board meeting? Uh, Dr. Sims, uh, there is not a mechanism at this board meeting I, when we were, you know, our ITE staff is, again, dealing with COVID. Um, so I, I didn't have them prioritize uh, the platform for this meeting as much. Um, we, uh, we had some issues determining uh, what type of mechanism we'd use to get public comment in this type of setup. Um, so we didn't have it today. Uh, I hope to have on the 23rd. I'm, I'm, I hope to have it return. Um, if we have the 23rd in person uh, with social distancing guidelines uh, in place, uh, it will be no different. I mean, we'll have public comment that calls to the public in the beginning and the end of the meeting, like we always do. Um, if we have to do it again in an electronic format, I'd like to think about some other alternative way. If people can submit short videos beforehand, that might, that might be something that we can do um, certainly for this meeting, if anyone has any comments, the, the board has an email address. Uh, they can email us or the public can email us anything you'd like. Um, so, you know, that, uh, that's certainly there. But for this meeting, uh, we do not have any calls to the public or, or for public comment. Um, I see Mike Manley raising his hand. Mike? Yeah, um, this is Mike Manley. Um, so like the State Board of Education and some other boards have had people submit their public comments in writing and they've either simply read them out loud or posted them um, either before or after the meeting. Um, and that I think fulfilled the uh, short-term public comment part during um, these uh, until we can meet back face-to-face. -face. That might be some, and an easy way to get over the bridge at least for one more meeting is to um, explicitly tell people that um, either we'll read them or post them. Um, thank you for that. But I, I think those are those are both ideas that we have to do it electronically next time is to have it either a submission of a short video that you could shoot on a, you know, an iPhone or something like that, or have a, a, a written email that you could submit and that'll be right into the record. Um, you know, similar to what we would have, you know, orally at the, at the meeting. Um, I see board member Bo raising her hand. Um, 
Hi, yes, this is Linda Bove. I'm wondering about the opportunity for public comment, maybe sending in videos and things like that. I just want to make sure that somehow we can and will do that type of announcement. And how will that work? Uh, I'm sorry, um, what, what type of, a, of announcement would we have to solicit that, that comment? OK. Um, yes, exactly. Sure. Uh, I would think that we can include it in the notice, you know, a week before these meetings, we, uh, we post the agenda and the ancillary documentation on board, uh, on board docs. Uh, so we would have in that announcement, a mechanism for the public to comment on that, you know, for, for those particular agenda items, if it's written, that'll be fine. We can have an email address and a deadline uh, for them to submit, uh, you know, e emails um, of a certain length. Uh, to a certain email address, and then anything received by a certain deadline, we'll, we'll read into the record. Um, if we do go the, the video uh, route, there might be some technical guidelines, but that would all be done on board docs. So if the, the public is interested in, in, in looking at that, it, again, pay attention to board docs, um, and, and you'll see instructions there uh, for, the, for the next meeting, pr provided it's, you know, we're not in person. And, and sure, absolutely. We want to make sure um that we do an announcement and let them know it's because of COVID-19 we want to give the public an opportunity you know they could send in a video or send in an email whatever their choice is and they're welcome to do so I just want them to know they're welcome to participate thank you sure no I, I thank you I, I understand and um for this meeting uh anyone can send an email of course um and uh if, you know make any kind of comment um, and I see board member Gordon is raising his hand. I am. Thank you, president. Um, we've been doing zoom meetings every day for six, eight weeks now, sometimes as many as 30, 40, 50 people on a call. And, uh, there's certainly growing pains that will occur, but it seems to be a, a really reliable format. And, uh, as Mark said before, you know, the opportunity to do electronic, uh, group meetings is uh, it's a format that I think we really should consider or as most everything will go forward, it'll be a hybrid and have a combination of maybe some people in person, but also some electronic uh, remote access because it, it really does work. And uh, in some ways, I think it even works better because uh, because just the, uh, the layout of the access uh, and the, the exchange uh, is a little more concise. And uh, I know this meeting has been uh, probably some growing pains, but overall, I, I think it's a, it's a format that's, that's here to stay. And I, I hate to think we don't, we might underutilize it. Thank you. All right, are there any other uh, comments from board members? Um, I see uh, board member Howard. Just real quick, one shout out to, if anybody else has already done it to the IT folks for setting this all up. I know it's complicated. Uh, job well done. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Um, I echo that as well. Okay, if there are no, no other items for next meeting, uh, we will move to 9.01 action item adjournment. Um, again, thank you everyone for joining us in this alternative format. Um, and uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I see board member Davison uh, raising her hand. I move to adjourn this meeting. Uh, oh, I, Can I we see hold one moment? Yeah, Shelly holding up her finger. So, okay. um, Shelly? Uh, yes, I'm sorry. This is Shelly again. Uh, before we adjourn, I wanna thank the interpreters and the captioners as well. Um, it's been excellent accessibility and I really appreciate that during this meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, all right, board member Davison. <laughs> <laughs> Motion. I move that we adjourn this meeting. Uh, I, 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 I second, are there all those in favor? Um, I see board member Gordon, Sims, Davison, <laughs> no. Bove, uh, 
uh, Manley and Howard all indicating yes. Uh, I vote yes as well. Um, and that is unanimous. Again, thank you everyone. Um, and to echo comments that others have said, uh, thank you for the interpreters and the IT staff for setting this up. We got the captioning, uh, we have the ASL interpretation, we have the live stream out to the public. It was, um, uh, it was not entirely clear how we were gonna do this, <laughs> you know, a, a month ago. So um, again, thank you very much. And I hope to see you all in person in July um, and we will we'll go from there. Thank you. All right, bye-bye, thank you.